Welcome to the Kupinger Kohl Analyst Chat. I'm your host. My name is Matthias Reinbart. I'm advisor and analyst with Kupinger Kohl Analysts. Today we want to talk about a topic that everybody's talking about, and we've mentioned that already in that in that podcast in several episodes. We want to talk about artificial intelligence, about machine learning, about the application of AI in cybersecurity. Um, and first of all, we want to learn more what AI actually is, not the definition, but the shapes and sizes and the forms in which we can um, observe it in reality, um, and then how it can be applied to cybersecurity. And for that, I have invited Alexei Balagansky. He is a lead analyst with Kupinger Cole, covering the cybersecurity area. Hi, Alexei. Good to have you back. Hello, Matthias. Thanks for having me again. Great to have you. And as I mentioned, we want to start with the typical notion that an IT savvy, a tech savvy guy or lady has when it comes to what is AI. So what is the definition of AI? And we all think in the first place of ChatGPT, so generative AI. Uh, that is the AI that everybody thinks of, but there is a category of non-generative AI, right? All right. Well, let me kind of uh, start with... Uh, uh... A short kind of look into the history because this whole topic of uh, AI applications in cybersecurity is definitely not new at all. Uh, it predates ChatGPT by quite a few years, and even we at Kupinger Co. has started writing about the subject many years ago. I just, uh, uh, before we started this recording, I looked into my own blog post from like six years ago, and yes, we were already talking about that. Of course, we did not know what Gen AI is, or probably nobody knew what what a GPT even supposed to mean, because they weren't invented yet. But you are absolutely right. Uh, this is just such a shame that for a lot of people, even in the IT field, uh, AI basically means ChatGPT, uh, a large language model uh, that generates texts uh, uh, for your prompts, which of course isn't true at all. Yes, we all know AI as an academic research subject started decades ago in like 50s or 60s, uh, and some practical applications were already available well, before I was born, probably even before you were born, Matthias. Uh, and uh, even back then, uh, cybersecurity probably did not exist, but uh, some of those early applications were already at least usable uh, in that particular area. And absolutely, uh, we already have uh, quite a, a large number of tools which are definitely AI based, uh, definitely used in cybersecurity and have nothing to do with ChatGPT. But let's again kind of uh, stop for a second and think why, uh, what, so what's wrong with uh, ChatGPT and LLMs and cybersecurity? They are great, they are awesome, everybody can use them. Well, yes, absolutely. And this is exactly why they are actually a risk, a liability. Uh, for a lot of companies, because uh, a typical large language model requires access to tons of sensitive data, which, well, being sensitive, it's already a huge liability and uh, an asset for cybersecurity tools. But also, uh, all those uh, uh, technologies, they are extremely computationally inefficient. They require tons of computing power, which, which is why most of those LLMs actually run in huge cloud data centers. And they require tons of electricity and water and air conditioning, you name it. And when I'm uh, currently reading about such uh, great innovations, like for example, using full homomorphic encryption to secure your large language models, I cannot but think about how much electricity uh, will it require and how closer and how faster it will bring us to a climate catastrophe. Because if you remember a few years ago, we were talking about Bitcoin mining, basically bringing us to uh, the heat death of the universe. Well, LLMs running in a fully homomorphic uh, encrypted environment would probably require orders of magnitude more resources. For that. So. In a nutshell, this is a completely unsustainable approach in the long term. And unfortunately, instead of thinking about, you know, like conservation of those resources, optimization and whatnot, 
people are still throwing more and more money and resources at LLMs because it's, well, we are riding the hype train with regards to that. Mm -hmm. And this is why today we actually wanted to approach this whole thing from a totally different perspective and try to identify sensible, lean, and practically possible solutions for all those AI use cases, right? Right. And maybe also use cases which do not demand for such a large footprint when it comes to calculation power, uh, the size of the model, then the energy consumed, and maybe even the location where the service is provided and where it is used from. It's, it does not necessarily be something that is provided from the cloud with all these um, 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 mechanisms that you described, so really large memory, large um, installations, a huge number of CPUs or GPUs uh, r running that. Maybe there are use cases, especially when we talk about cybersecurity, where there is only the need for a limited model um, providing limited functionality and maybe even not generative AI. Um, because this is just a part of the equation. This is by far not the full picture of the types of, of algorithms, of models, that and, and the outcome and the way how they work um, that, that machine learning covers. And just to go back to that, um, I, I like to tell that story because when I went to university, I studied at the Deutsches Forschungszentrum für Künstliche Intelligenz, at least at the professor who worked there, and that was... 1987 and we uh, we did we did ai but we did some uh, completely different ai we did automated reasoning we did lambda calculus we did um we pro programmed in scheme and lisp and and uh, these quest mm -hmm. uh, languages and it was ai way back then it was a very different type of ai so there we could talk about the history of ai for hours um but as you said it's really a topic that um, accompanied me from my early days at university up until now, and now it's just exploding. Um, but very, it's, it's exploding in a very limited, visible sector, and that's what you said. So everybody talks about JetGPT. That's machine learning. Yeah, it is, but it's not fully. It's, it goes far beyond that. Well, just recently, I've read an interesting article somewhere online. And uh, I w uh, was kind of uh, impressed by uh, a short quote I remember from it. It says, we were promised uh, artificial intelligence decades ago. What we got instead is artificial mediocrity. Right. And I know that you probably uh, do not subscribe to my kind of skepticism of LLMs in general, but we cannot but uh, accept the fact that uh, ChatGPT specifically was designed and adopted and kind of exploded in popularity exactly because it's not really uh, AI in that uh, traditional academic sense. It's not a thing that emulates human brain. It's a thing that emulates all those uh, monkeys with typewriters and it does it exceptionally well. Uh, and the, the problem is, yes, uh, uh, this kind of model can do a lot to automate processing of texts and videos and audios, whatever, it can draw interesting pictures, but it is uh, fundamentally uh, uh, incapable of, on one, on the one hand, creating anything truly original, and on the other hand, at least until now, to understand its own limitations. This is why we hear so many examples of like ChatGPT recommending you to put glue on your pizza, or something like, or uh, for pregnant women to smoke a lot of cigarettes daily, because uh, well, you just cannot tell uh, things uh, which are fundamentally true from those which are fundamentally satire or just plain lies, whatever. So LLMs are easily manipulated, and this is why it's extremely important that for any application in business or cybersecurity in particular, you have to feed any language model with correct data because otherwise you get garbage in, garbage out. But again, kind of going back to our uh, original list, uh, I guess we can uh, confess to our listeners that we actually cheated a little bit and we asked ChatGPT to give us a list sure. of the most interesting potential use cases for AI and cybersecurity. And we will just uh, go through that list and try to, well, evaluate uh, the, those suggestions from a human perspective, I guess. 
So why exactly don't we start from the number one? Yeah, and, and, and it's really also important to understand which kind of AI, which kind of machine learning actually is required to solve these tasks. And and as you said, we, we created that list and it re really was a, a larger prompt. And I am, you and I, we are quite fans of proper prompts and proper content stuffing to get to the feedback. And this is what we not, not did. We asked it just for what it already knew. So not providing too much knowledge from our side, but just to say, okay, what do people think of when they say AI use cases in cybersecurity? Right. And of course, everybody has this notion you have you are in a big sock in a big um, 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 operations center when it comes to security. Um, everybody says, "Okay, AI must be good at threat detection and analyzing lots of data, identifying anomalies and suspicious right. activities, right. and then at least signaling that there is something wrong." That should be a typical AI use case. Am I right? Well, first of all, we have to uh, define our terms very specifically. A threat and an anomaly are two completely different things. True. So detecting anomalies, detecting like outliers in a statistical sample of data is a, a, a problem which has been solved probably decades, if not centuries, before the invention of AI as a thing, because it's a purely statistical problem. And well, I have actually, I have a university degree in statistics, and this is what I've studied for six years how to basically analyze large data sets and find anomalies. You do not need a computer for that, actually. But of course, uh, if you are using the quote-unquote traditional machine learning uh, methods, which have nothing to do with generative AI, by the way, uh, you can apply those methods to identify those outliers, which on its own is, again, a problem which has been solved for at least a decade and it's widely utilized in many existing security tools. But detecting anomalies alone is not very productive. Uh, I always like to remember that one project we had a few years ago where a company uh, acquired the best of breed uh, vulnerability scanner and ended up with a list of 3 million vulnerabilities. So you can run a, a, a machine learning based uh, anomaly detection tool and you will get millions of those anomalies. What do you do? How do you even start approaching those, those millions? This is why uh, a, a really high quality and modern next gen AI based uh, security analytic solution has to do better than that. It should be able to not just identify anomalies, it should be able to filter out all those kind of noisy points, the false positives, and only focus on the real things, uh, meaningful things, then it should be able to somehow correlate those findings uh, with an existing threat framework, if you will, like uh, famous MITRE attack framework. Basically, it should not tell, just tell you something odd happened. It should tell you, I am detecting uh, an intrusion through a specific uh, attack vector, and it looks like this kind of attack and it looks like the hackers are doing this from a specific uh, dangerous domain and uh, here are the artifacts which will help you even further narrow down the, the problem and this is again this is what existing tools are able to do for years it has nothing to do with gen ai or chat gpt uh, does chat gpt have a use here absolutely it does for example no matter how deep and uh, fine your funnel is you would still end up with probably at least dozens of findings how do you even start uh choosing the, the most dangerous one well this is where your uh, ai uh, assistant can probably offer some kind of uh, recommendation based on the history of previous uh, incidents or based on this huge knowledge based uh shared across other customers of the two or just kind of on the external threat intelligence, it might just give you an additional hint on which uh, incident is more important. Where do you have to act first to uh, avoid a bigger breach, for example, or to uh, contain the impact and so on. Absolutely, AI can uh, support you with that. The, the only problem is that should you trust the recommendation of that AI assistant? 
can you even give it the opportunity to act automatically? Or do you want to have at least a kill switch in your hand? Yeah, I think the importance is the human factor still being added. So we have on the one hand the statistic models that you've mentioned, so that that that, that you correlate co correlate data, that you collect the data, that you have lots of data, which of course includes um, lots of noise. So the signal to noise ratio is just much too bad to act upon. So the next thing is really to understand what are the thresholds, what are the patterns that I want to identify, that I want to apply to, to boil down um, this signal to noise ratio to something where I can start acting upon. Uh, so that, that would be the next thing. But that can only work on existing relevant training data. Um, that is what, a, what an AI then does. Other, everything else would require somebody really de thinking very deep to define manual rules, to put it that way. Uh, and that is the, 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 way, the, the point where the AI really comes in. And I will fully agree, it requires, in addition, at least for spot checks, the human factor to look into things. Would you agree? Well, uh, kind of uh, to put it into a slightly different perspective, what you need in the end, you need to be able to quantify your findings, to quantify the risks, right? And there is a multitude of approaches. But those approaches, they cannot be defined by, AI, by an AI. It has to be a kind of a scientifically proven and better tested methodology, which would probably take years of development. And it would be uh, tailored specifically to your business or your industry or your geography, because it would depend on a, mu a multitude of external factors. And this is again kind of perhaps uh, uh, generative AI can help you on that journey, but it will never be able to create such a methodology for you. And perhaps it would help you to act upon that methodology later. But again, kind of, this is something which needs a lot of uh, controls at every stage where a decision is made, right? Right. And I think what, what could be possible and what is possible could be a kind of, of iterative improvement process. So uh, all, all the time, on the one hand, injecting the knowledge of the scientific approach that you've mentioned, but also refining um, and evaluating results and then getting better in defining these, these processes so that it can be a, a duo of, of the AI and the human factor to, to, to improve these specific bespoke and very uh, detailed me mechanisms that work fine for that scenario and will fail in any other scenario. So really be having a bespoke um, environment and the new and way, the bespoke uh, rule set. Yeah, and by the way, I can totally imagine that in the future, there will be multiple AI agents working on problems like that, coordinated or maybe at least like uh, orchestrated by a human person, uh, kind of a decision maker. But still, this is not something which you can get from ChatGPT today. Absolutely, I think there, there I fully agree. Um, and, but but we are also on in an evolution that is really happening fast. So we are looking at things happening right now, which are really, really surprising and and interesting. These these are apart from geopolitical facts. We are living in interesting times when it comes to the evolution of machine learning in general. Um, a few weeks ago, I took part in an, in a in a um, no, no no now I'm missing the words now um, in a conference for uh, for um, and for AGI so the the the, the real AI um, and and they are daring at universities in Seattle to to execute these these conferences on AGI for quite a while already so there is development there as well so it's interesting times to watch things happen. Um, but when you go back to, again, cybersecurity and, and, and the machine learning that we have at hand right now, um, yes, there are limitations. They need to be clearly understood. Um, but maybe adding three AIs with different aspects can at least um, do some heavy lifting also when it comes to solution design, um, a mechanism, a specification for getting better at cybersecurity without human ingenuity. Right, right. Okay, what's next on our list? Behavioral analytics. So um, quite cl quite close to that. It's just just a different different aspect of data to look at to identify a anomalies, b threats. 
I would say it's uh, it's also a different scale. Usually when you are thinking about behavioral profiling, it's something which takes uh, place over weeks and months of analysis, right? Uh, you have to understand uh, how uh, actors, people, systems, uh, malware, whatever, operate normally and uh, how to detect large scale deviations from those uh, normal profiles. So absolutely, it's it's the same uh, uh, methodology, it's the same technology, it's statistics or machine learning has nothing to do with generative AI. And again, it's a largely a solved problem for cybersecurity industry. And again, it depends enormously on the quality and quantity of input data. This is why uh, the leading vendors in this area are usually those large companies which operate the huge uh, own security clouds like Microsoft or, or CrowdStrike, for example, uh, to name a few com company names. And this is why it is something which ideally uh, would depend a lot on this notion of the wisdom of the crowd. If you are right. a customer of such a solution, you should be able to opt in into sharing your data with other customers because they would be sharing theirs with you and you will be basically improving each other's quality of life and security. Right. And, and, and I remember way back three years, four years ago, when we did our first AI related conference uh, at Kubinger Cole, I, I did a, a talk about when is AI useful? And one important aspect was when there is enough training data available, which is historic and, a lo and enough data available at any given time to act upon. And that, that, that's what you just said. Um, and when it comes to behavioral data, that might be just not be sufficient when to get to reasonable results that are actually beneficial to anything. But there are other aspects where there is enough data. And, and um, I th what would be such a thing? Net network data. So, so I think uh, looking at, at large data centers, um, which with tons of traffic passing through, finding anomalies, threats in there, um, that would be something where you have A, training data, and B, a, a, a constant throughput of good data you can act upon. Would that be the case? Oh, it is absolutely the case. I, I even think uh, ChatGPT has suggested this uh, later in this list. So yeah, absolutely. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's that's what what I was aiming at because um, it's it's a good point to say okay yeah we actually um, we we have anomaly detection when it comes to to um, behavioral uh, analytics but um, anomaly detection network traffic um, and if I go back from uh, go, or go away from that list um, and just compare those two and apply the, the the metrics that I applied four years ago or so um, yeah there's the training data and then an an, an automated mechanism with, uh, leveraging AI machine learning can provide benefit because there's there's enough volume to act upon. Yes. You have, however, to consider one kind of additional factor here. A lot of uh, network traffic nowadays is encrypted by default, which of sure. course kind of makes it uh, not particularly useful for AI training. It is still possible to a degree, and there are some interesting developments in that, uh, kind of combining the deep packet uh, inspection with some... Uh, really fancy uh, ML methods, you can probably infer something about that encrypted traffic. But if you really need to look deeply into every security event, you have to do this traffic inspection at a point where you can actually have this traffic, traffic unencrypted. So either you have to set up a huge gateway, which would do a TLS termination, decryption analysis, and then re-encrypting it again, which uh, in a lot of industries and uh, even Region. countries is not a good idea at all. Or you have to be able to do it in a hugely uh, distributed way. Basically, you would have like uh, a network tap in each of your IoT devices and microservices and endpoint, and somehow they should be able to send their findings into some centralized place for analysis, but in a uh, privacy preserving and secure way, like for example, only collect your traffic metadata and not the actual data. So there's a lot of uh, unsolved or at least like very difficult collateral problems to solve in this area. And this is, I guess, where the majority of innovation is happening now. So yes, absolutely. It is about network 
traffic, but there is a lot of uh, unsolved problems here to address. Right. So uh, full, fully agree. So if we quickly walk through a few more of these items on our list, so the, the next thing that we have is cloud security monitoring. Um, is, is this something where, and you are the expert, you're doing, you're, you're talking to the vendors, you're talking as an analyst in different segments. Is this something where actually AI plays a meaningful role already? I would say, well, first of all, it's a really broad subject on its own. Like uh, the problem with the cloud is that kind of, it's not the, the actual detection, which is the hard problem, because again, most of those solutions, they would look for known vulnerabilities and known misconfigurations. The question is, how do you uh, correlate uh, and prioritize those findings? Because it, if you don't want to end up with millions of uh, vulnerabilities to deal with, you have to know, is this particular vulnerability in this particular environment under these particular conditions really a threat? Can it be exploited? Uh, is this device actually connected to the public internet? Is it being targeted? Is there an exploit in the wild? You have to bring in a lot of uh, separate technology. You have to have great uh, threat intelligence. You have to have uh, a lot of uh, well, software security analytics, uh, code analysis probably and stuff like that. You have to maintain large databases of known vulnerabilities and so on and so forth. I guess uh, it's not the AI that would be uh, the biggest differentiator. It's uh, packaging all those capabilities into a cohesive platform, a useful tool. And again, kind of, uh, we do have a lot of interesting uh, published research in that area, and we can probably discuss specific vendors in a one-to-one -one call with the customer, but it would probably take another hour of our podcast, so let's just move on. <laughs> Right, right. We're already far in this episode, but you've mentioned that, and I really would like to to maybe focus on that as, as the final item for today. You've mentioned, do I trust the AI doing something on my behalf when it comes to, for example, um, identifying measures that protect my network, my data, my environment, even maybe my 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 employees? Um, when it comes to, to physical security. We, the, the, the fourth thing on that list is automated incident response. So the AI helps, I read it out, helps automate responses to cyber incidents, reducing response time and mitigating damage. A, is this possible? B, what is required? C, do we trust it? And D, should we watch it? Uh, well, this is absolutely possible. Uh, there have been solutions uh, offered on the market for years already. The biggest challenge for them was to exactly, you mentioned it, to overcome the mistrust of the customers. For a lot of industries, they will just say no, absolutely no automated incident response, whatever rules-based or script-based or AI-based, we do not want any automated responses at all because we put safety and continuity of our processes above everything else. Like, why do we care if a hacker is still in our data if when we attempt to block him, our entire power plant goes down? Absolutely impossible. But uh, I have to, ch to say that kind of the whole uh, notion of ChatGPT and this whole evolved uh, public opinion on AI in general has changed this attitude a lot. What was absolute impossibility like five years ago, now it's... It's a chance, like a lot of companies would say, yeah, we actually might at least consider it. Uh, the question is, can your solution uh, give us uh, the opportunity to adopt this uh, kind of at our own pace? So first you want to see what it would do, like kind of in a dry run mode. Then we would probably test it on some of our less important systems, not less risky ones. Maybe, uh, uh, doing something which is like, but won't disrupt anything important. And then it kind of uh, expand and adopt it. And it, yeah, this is absolutely happening, but again, kind of, uh, you never know what can happen. And the same crowd strike incident comes to mind. This is what happened to companies who were a little bit too eager to adopt blanket security monitoring. And again, it had nothing to do or, or little to do with AI, but again, kind of, this is where you have to be extremely careful understanding the criticality of your own systems. And nobody can actually 
understand it better than you. So you have to, to do it. You have to learn the methodologies. You have to talk to experts, but you have to decide. Right. I think that that is an important, actually, almost final statement. I want to I want to provide one other aspect. And, and, and now we are leaving parts of cybersecurity, although it's a part of cybersecurity. When we do access governance and identity and access management, there is this huge exercise of recertifying access across lots of people with lots of entitlements. And from the outside, this looks like something where AI can really... Um, pro provide re real value to organizations to say, okay, um, if you give me the rules and you give me the training data and if you give me previous results, I can approve or at, at least give a hint whether an access can be approved or should be removed, etc. Um, and there are solutions out there that exactly promote this, that help in large-scale recertification campaigns. The problem is that Uh, the auditors don't like that. Um, when it comes to having an AI doing the recertification process, then we are missing out the human factor and it is required for this recertification because you need the application owner, the data owner, the system owner, um, the governance department in, in, in that equation. And that would be eliminated unless you have a proper process. And, where, and then it re really is reduced when it comes to the to the usability to the benefits that you want to achieve with that um, and i think we are on that learning curve that you just mentioned so people see that uh, jet gpt any ai and this is not only jet gpt any generative ai can on the one hand provide impressive results that are really striking and really surprising uh, on the one day and then in the next minute it provides utter unusable results to not use any other words um, so so it's really the balance between both and it still says when you when you log into these machines it says there can be uh, it can pro can provide wrong results it can provide unproven results or please check the the results and the same holds true for everything that we're doing um, so it's it's really an interesting um, um, new technology it's not that new as we have already learned but it's making its way into traditional solutions providing new capabilities and i think that's really a, a, an interesting journey to watch as a user as a vendor as an analyst um, so we we will continue that 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 analysis um, and it is changing quite dramatically right now in the perception any final thoughts from your side well absolutely uh, the technology is almost there already as you just mentioned there are some amazing developments there are some amazing embarrassments as well true uh, i guess it all boils down to finding the right balance between technology risk trust and regulation Again, kind of risk should be the primary uh, decision point for you because your business continuity your financial success depends on that again kind of you should not blindly trust any technology claim because We know that we are not there yet in terms of real AI of any kind. And then you have also keep in mind that uh, even if you will manage to find a seemingly ideal solution for your problem, there will always be someone unhappy with that, be it an auditor or somebody from the state or from the industrial regulation board whatever so you have to find the right balance and i guess uh, to do that you have to talk to experts from different areas including copying a call perhaps i think that is a very um, 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 brilliant approach to choose so talk to us um so i leave it with that from from the from the, from the topic perspective To the audience, as usual, if you have any questions um, around that topic, if you if you think we should cover that in more detail differently, if you think we made a mistake, if you think you have questions that we uh, should discuss together with you, um, maybe a new episode on a slightly different angle of that topic, please leave your comments um, in the comment sections on YouTube or reach out to Alexei or me with your questions. Um, We would love to continue that discussion. It's This is our daily work, and we are really trying to, to benefit from you, and we're trying to provide uh, useful feedback and in, information to our audience and our customers. So uh, we are really looking forward to receiving your feedback and that you reach out to us. Um, 
AI powered cybersecurity is a topic that will continue to be on our radar uh, for the next years. Um, maybe it will be a complete disruption of that. I don't know. Um, so let's wait and see how that evolves uh, for the time being. Alex, it was a pleasure to have you as my guest today. It was an interesting discussion to talk about the use of JetGPT while using a list provided by JetGPT. That was, that was a fun exercise. Um, and I think it really worked out because we now have at least identified a few aspects where maybe generative AI is, isn't the, the solution, but where machine learning still can provide in different use cases, right. proper solutions. Thanks again, Alexei. Thank uh, you. Looking forward to talking to you soon. Bye.